This is Georgia Southern Football 90, featuring the defending NCAA national champion, Georgia Southern Eagles. This program is brought to you by Team Baden Azuzu. We are the competition. And by Atlantic Cellular, it's for you, Savannah. Now here's your host, Bill Edwards, and Georgia Southern University head football coach, Tim Stowers. Good evening, everybody, from right outside the Student Union here at Georgia Southern University, another edition of uh, Georgia Southern Football 90, and another time when the Dukes are coming to town, Tim, and these guys want to return the favor. After we beat them at homecoming last year, they had a big lead on us, and then we came back and, and beat those guys, and now they have to come down here and want to do the same to us. Well, James Madison brings another great football team to Georgia Southern to play us Saturday afternoon at 1 o'clock. They've got a tremendous fullback. It's Willie Lanier's son. that used to be the mm -hmm. great football player at uh, Kansas City. 6'2", 245, and Doc Spurgeon insists that he's over 260. I mean, he is a big football player, and that's an unusual size for a fullback. they got a quarterback in Eric Green, and another thing is that they're gone to an offense that's similar to Georgia Southern's type offense, and that quarterback, Eric Williams, could come down to Georgia Southern and run Georgia Southern's offense. He can make you miss. He can throw the ball. Uh, he's a good football player. They got the biggest offensive line we faced this year. Their right guard, 6'2", 310. Uh, their wide receiver, Hayes, or I believe it's Hayes, uh, is 6'6", 205 pounds. I'm not sure. I think we can cover him man to man, but I'm not sure our 5'10", or 5'9", defensive bats can out jump him for the football. You know, that's the concern. They've got an All-American free safety, Upton Jackson, who is an outstanding football player. They've also got two defensive tackles in Fahid and Jamel Harris, I think are great football players. They've always got those big, tall guys that are like 6'3", 6'4", 235, and they seem to have more of them than anybody else we play. They've always been big and good, and they've always um, come down here and given us a, a real rough game. I want to quit, quit scheduling these people for homecoming, Tim. Well, I don't have anything to do with that. Uh, <laughs> Coach Wagner does the scheduling and decide which game is for homecoming. Uh, it should be a good football game. I hope it's a great day for football because we're expecting a sellout this weekend. And we really need our fans to be in the football game because we need to start off quickly in the first quarter and make something happen and not wait till the fourth quarter to make something happen. And I think our kids are starting to understand that a little bit more. Hey, let's start playing from the time we kick the ball off. Let's don't wait until we got to have it in that critical situation to make something happen and make the play. I think it's going to be one of those, one of those awards. It ought to be a great football game to come watch. All right. And we'll show you the first half highlights of the JMU contest right after this. A perfect homecoming afternoon could only be topped off with a victory over a tough James Madison squad, and the partisans would not be disappointed. Last year, you may recall fullback Willie Lanier ran through the Eagle defense like gangbusters in the first half. This year will be quite a different story. On first down, Willie got waxed. That pretty much set the tone for the afternoon. And on third and five, Eric Williams' pass out to split end Keith Thornton got only three before the Eagle welcome wagon with Kevin Whitley and Shane Maxwell in the driver's seat drove Mr. Thornton to the turf. And punter Scott Todd was darn lucky to get this one away before Mark Giles got there first. In fact, it looked like Mark might have gotten a piece of it. The Eagles were only 54 yards away from pay dirt. And Saturday turned out to be payday, as Raymond Gross, on the very first play from scrimmage, uncorked the bomb to Terrence Sorrell. The New Jersey flash was streaking down the sidelines behind his defender, and Raymond laid it right in his hand. Terrence went strutting into six-point land, and with Mike Dowis PAT, it was 7-0 GSU. And get ready to enjoy this one again, Southern fans. Here it is. Meanwhile, the Southern Inhospitality Committee was holding another meeting. On first down, JMU quarterback Eric Williams looked for a brief moment as if he might get outside, but Paul Sickley cut him down. And on third and six, defensive end Giff Smith came charging in unchallenged to swat Williams' pass out of the sky. But Southern could get nowhere in their next possession, not so with the Dukes when they got the ball back. They started to move and move fast. 
On first and 10 from their 37, Eric Williams went darting off left tackle for 28 yards down to the GSU 35. And did this hot dog need some mustard or what? The Southerner saw to it he was smeared with blue poupon on the next play when Paul Sickley stepped in front of this flight and skyjacked Mr. Williams' pass and proceeded to take it 39 yards in the opposite direction down to the enemy 30. At which point Paul, too, decided he should have a hand. He got it. Yeah, it came at a right prime opportunity just there. Um, the uh, halfback was going right up the hash, and like I said, the defensive line was putting a lot of pressure on him, and um, he just threw it right into coverage. <laughs> is, is there a tendency sometimes when all of a sudden you see the football and you say, and, and you could miss it because you say, I can't believe this guy's throwing this football right in my hands? I never thought I was going to get there, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I thought it was going to slow motion, but um, yeah, why is it? got into my hands. I, I looked around. All I saw was green in front of me. I couldn't believe it. So I just ran as fast as I could. From there, it took the Eagles all of one whole play to cover those 30 yards as Raymond Gross hit. Who else? Terrence Sorrell again in the wide open spaces. And you can call defensive back Robert Smart, ironically enough from nearby Clio, toast. As boy, was he burned on this play. So the Eagles' two scoring drives had consisted of two passes to Terrence Sorrell and had consumed about 15 seconds. Well, you know, it's, it's good when you can do that. Uh, you know, we had a good day, and we got the ball to the open people, and we dropped back the pass, and, uh, you know, that's what the passing game's all about, making a big play, and uh, we made it. Did you expect that one, to, <laughs> that one to develop so well both times? Well, we knew that the, uh, the second one would, would pretty much, somebody would be open, but I didn't think it would be... Uh, Terrence, really I thought it was going to be one of the Abex, Carl, I hopped, and uh, it just, the corner rolled up, and I saw him, and I just got the ball to him. Yeah, what were they doing? I mean, the first time he'd had his man beat, you just threw a perfect pass down there, but uh, the second time, it looked like he was just wide open. Well, the corner rolled up hard, and that was the backside corner, and, uh, you know, I don't know what kind of scheme they were playing, but it was the wrong one, and uh, <laughs> we got the ball to Terrence because he was wide open. We, we need to get it out to a good start against James Lass because last year they played us tough. And, you know, with the homecoming atmosphere, we wanted to get out quick, you know, to get established and then go from there. Well, I think the first two passes you caught, you consumed something like 16 seconds and scored 14 points. Yeah, well, um, it was, you know, the corner, he'd been on a, on a route. You know, he read, he read the quarterback, and, you know, he wasn't covering me, and I was out there by myself, and it was a great pass. For a while, we went through the Great American Pun Exchange and say Saddam Hussein, you might have taken Kuwait, but you're not taking the K.A.'s. It was late in the first quarter when Eric Williams made another critical mistake when he overthrew one target and strong safety Jim Mutimer was there to pick it off. Um, there, we were playing uh, three roll and uh, I rolled over the top. Uh, Rodney came off on the guy in the flat and I came across and uh, intercepted the pass from him and I trip and stumble. I wish I could have kept my feet. <laughs> but uh, it was good rush by a defensive line, and the linebackers helped us out a lot today. As Coach Tim Stowers looked on, the second quarter began with a bang as Raymond kept it himself, went left, cut back against the grain to his right, and picked his way through the JMU traffic for 20 yards down to the enemy 25. Then on second and five, Lester Eford hit a hole created by John Wilson, Rex Nottage, and Rusty Parrish for eight more yards. And three plays later, Raymond rolled out and stretched his way into the end zone for a 21 to nothing lead. But James Madison wasn't going home without a fight. And before intermission, they'd shaved 10 points off Southern's lead, starting with Eric Williams' nine-yard pass to Dwayne Hayes. Then on second and five, Williams hit Keith Thornton for a 30-yard chunk down to the Eagle 18. Three plays later, Williams hooked up with split in Dwayne Hayes, who split the defense, made a great move back to the inside, and found clear sailing to the end zone. And no sooner had the Dukes gotten the ball back when they began yet another scoring march. On second and eight from the Southern 41, Eric Williams ran the quarterback draw for 10 yards.
And when Williams found Keith Thornton coming across the middle, you could chalk up another 15 for the Dukes. It looked like JMU would not be denied. Willie Lanier twisting and turning his way for four more yards down to the 11. But on third and goal from the five, Williams could get only three as Paul Sickley and Mark Giles came up quickly to stop him two yards shy of the goal line. And the Dukes decided to settle for a field goal. So the Eagles went to the locker room guarding an 11 point lead, 21 to 10. And stick around, women's basketball coach Dream Greer will join us at halftime as Georgia Southern Football 90 continues. Our halftime guest is Dream Greer. She's a head women's basketball coach here at Georgia Southern, and they are the defending conference champion. And Dream of this has to be. Uh, you, you've developed a great tradition here. These girls are winning big. The new facilities are, are just making things a lot better. The crowds are getting bigger. You have to be real pleased with the direction the, the, conference, the um, program is taking. Well, we have some young ladies in here that are, that are hoping to, to keep us going with that tradition. We have uh, Tracy Wilson, who was a senior this year, that was the uh, MVP of our tournament last year. Vet Cooper, who was a senior, our point guard, who was just an excellent player, as well as Trina Simmons uh, being an excellent player. We f are hoping that all three of those people will be all conference players for this year. What, uh, when people come out, have you noticed that the crowds are, are getting a little bigger now? I mean, you're, you're winning more, and people are beginning to, to appreciate women's basketball, I think, more and more and more. Well, we play a pretty exciting brand of basketball, and that kind of brings a few folks in the gym. Uh, we play a pressing game, uh, an up-tempo, fast-breaking style of basketball, and that's fun for the players to play and fun for people to come out and watch. Uh, as far as the program here uh, develops, it looks like everything is, is on the upswing here at Georgia Southern, and you guys are certainly a part of that. Well, we, we hope so. Uh, we feel like that uh, our women's basketball program is one that, that just needs to take one next step. What's what our, our goals are for the women's program, to take the very next step to get us into, the, say, the top 50 teams in the whole country. And Georgia Southern's not far from that at all. You've got a pretty tough schedule, too. We do play a very tough schedule. We play uh, our, our Thanksgiving tournament. We open up with Iowa State, uh, Tennessee State, and South Florida in that tournament. Uh, after that, we go to Appalachian. From there, we, we go on and play South Carolina here. Uh, we go down to the University of Florida in a tournament there. We then go down to uh, New Orleans to play in a tournament. And then we have coming in here Vanderbilt later on in the year. So uh, there's no rest for the weary. And they have a girl that's 6'7", is that what you said? She's 6'7", that's all. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dreamy, you've done a great job. It's a great winning tradition. We look forward to your winning the conference again this year and putting some folks in the stands and coming to see play of basketball. We appreciate your help. Thanks a lot. Right. Our guest at halftime, Dreamer Greer, the head women's basketball coach here at Georgia Southern University, and we'll be back with the second half of the JMU contest after this. Oh, heck, it was a homecoming weekend, so why not a marriage proposal as the telltale sign was hung out of the Murphy booth? Meanwhile, the Dukes were busy trying to catch up and doing a fine job of it as Eric Williams kept for four yards to the GSU 36. Then Williams zipped a 10-yarder to flanker Mike Campbell, who made a great leaping catch between a couple of defenders for a first down of the GSU 21. But the Southern defense would have no more. On third and 11, Tim Brown sacked Williams for a two-yard loss, and it was field goal time again. And Mike Granuzzo booted the Dukes within eight, 21 to 13. And Southern needed something to happen. Yeah, we kept. I think that was very big right before going into half. We, we held them to a field goal. And then when they came back out and they drove the ball down again, we held them to a field goal. I, th I think that we, we, we grew up a lot stopping them there. Uh, we should have put them away early when it was at 21 nothing. but they're a good football team. But one thing I think the players and the coaches were proud of, when it came fourth quarter, we dominated. And that's a mark of a good football team. And that's a team that can dominate in the fourth quarter as a playoff team. And that's what we're trying to achieve right now. But you can, you know, you can give it up in between the 20s and really in between the goal lines. You can have a bend but don't break attitude. And I think that's the type of attitude our defense is, uh, has at this point. And late in the third quarter, the Eagles began to make things happen again. Raymond's pitch to Darrell Hopkins on the right corner gained 11. But a pass to Hop on third and four was even nicer as Raymond dropped straight back and zipped it over the middle to Hop for 19 yards. But later, a beautiful third and 20 play would be nullified by what was referred to as a clip as Raymond will fire to Hop again. 
a great block gets Darrell loose. The block was interpreted as the clip. Hop will lose the ball toward the end of the run, but Carl Miller alertly picks it up and almost scores. But all was for naught. It was canceled by that clipping call. Oh, well, sometimes you get the elevator, sometimes you get the shaft. On third and 22, it was take this. Raymond found Hop again. And even though the defender was real close, Hop made the play and a 28-yard pickup. Second play of the final stanza, Mike Dowis came in to boot a 30-yard field goal to put Southern back out front by 11, 24 to 13. One of the reasons for JMU's success this season has been the time Eric Williams has had to throw. But in the fourth quarter, time was on the Eagle side as Alex Mash and Jack Harris downed Williams for a six-yard loss. And it was time for Georgia Southern to take complete command. And so they did. On first and 24, long yardage was part of this week's game plan. Gross hit Carl Miller, who used more moves than an indicted attorney to get 22 of them. Then Joe Ross finally got into the act, and Joe found a hole off right guard. He was through it in a flash for 14 more yards down to the Dukes 13. And on second and goal, it was Ross up and over the top. Just barely, but that's all you need. 31-13 Eagles. You know, we kind of slacked off, and you know that wasn't a good, um, you know, test to see how you know how good we were. But um, if we plan on getting any better, we gotta finish the game off. You know what I mean? We gotta when we get somebody down, just finish them off so we can really work on next week. You're running some some good plays inside again today, uh, and scored that uh, got got the leap on the touchdown there at the end. Well, like I said, I didn't run the ball much this game again because, uh, like I said, we jumped on them with the pass. They they were too run conscious, and we we went, we went over the top, and that that hurt them. Yeah, they started driving us right there at the end. We got a little complacent after the 21-0 lead and started letting them back into the game. Um, we finally came out after halftime, after stopping them right there, and um, came back with the same enthusiasm as we had in the first half, first quarter, and uh, just really wanted to shut them out from there on out. Okay. We did. Uh, you know, we didn't We didn't have to kill their instinct, and that's what Coach Styles is always saying, because we could have put them away in the first half, and we just let them stay in the game. and. You know, we just got to go ahead and take it to people and knock them out in the first half, and then, you know, a lot of other players can get some PT. The um, the defense came up with the big plays when they had to today. Um, a couple of times, I say Jim Mutimer had an interception. Sickley had an interception that uh, that stopped a drive. Well, we had some big plays on defense, and, you know, they turned the ball over, and I don't believe, knock on wood, I don't believe we had any turnover once again. It just goes to show you if you don't have any turnovers on offense and you have a good kicking game and you play good defense and block and tackle on offense and defense, you're always going to have a chance to win the football game. And it looked like, you know, although the first couple of touchdowns were scored, I think we had 14 points in 16 seconds. You finally put together uh, in the fourth quarter, put together a sustained drive, kept the football, kept them from having it, and, and got the points and just put them away. Right. Well, we need to do that. You know, we need to have some drives where we keep our defense off. See, I looked at halftime stats. I believe we had the ball for eight minutes. You know, and they had it for a large number, a long time. And that keeps our defense on the field too long. Of course, our defense has the choice of <laughs> staying out there three downs and making them punt, if you want to look at it another way. But we do need to have some long, sustained drives. And we've had a few this year. But we're always looking for more consistency on offense and more consistency on defense. And we've still got time to improve. But speaking of improvement, nowhere has there been more improvement on this team than along the offensive line. Those poor, forgotten souls we never think about until they mess up and no one along the offensive line has worked any harder to improve than Carl Springs, Florida sophomore Rex Nottage. Yeah, uh, we started off the beginning of the year pretty slow uh, with new new coaches and the immature off the line. We made some transitions and just like after Eastern Kentucky, uh, we like saying every game's a playoff game. And from there we just, coaches, Coach Hodges and Coach Styers have really been busting our tails in practice and we just been pushing ourselves to the limit and practicing that it's showing off since northeast louisiana now we're just building on and looking like an old georgia southern football line which is great tell me about today now you guys uh we, we started off we, we we jumped on them real early um uh, but they looked like they were they were prepared for, for us to run more than we passed yeah that, that kind of shot me too <laughs> uh that's great jumping off the 14 nothing lead like that uh we still made little mistakes our, our running running game didn't get off as well like we hoped it would but at least we, if we can sell them both, uh, running and pass, I don't think anyone can stop us. Yeah. Knock on wood. <laughs> Knock on wood. But uh, 
we still got a little mistakes. We still got a lot more to work on. And uh, as far as improvement, we, we still got a long way to go. And hopefully it be like the old Georgia Southern go all the way. Okay. But we got to take one game at a time. Trying a new quarterback didn't help the Dukes either. Tom Green on third and two from the GSU 38 caught fumbleitis. And Mark Giles was on the scene. And Georgia Southern had put their fifth in a row in the win column with UT Chattanooga on the horizon. And coach Tim Stowers will have a final comment in a moment.